Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along today as we welcome the co-leaders of the eExtension Educational Technology Learning Network, Paul Hill from Utah State University. Hey, Paul. Hi, how's it going? And Jamie Sager from The Ohio State University. Jamie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and periodically, uh, Paul and Jamie join us here on the podcast to talk about new technologies and extension innovations and uh and new things that are happening uh, with the uh, Educational Technology Learning Network. And uh, we uh, are going to talk today as well about their role in the uh, Innovation Task Force that was created by the Extension Committee on Organization and Policy, or ECOP, um, and talk a little bit about that process. So, Jamie, what was that ECOP Innovation Task Force process like? Um, well, <laughs> we, uh, we met uh, initially at Nexi face-to-face. That was our one and only time that we met face-to-face. Uh, we have a great mix of members that served on the, the task force. We had some um, directors, Deb Shealy from um, Rhode Island, um, and, we all, and, and Doug Steele, I believe. Also, Chris Geith, um, CEO for eExtension, served on the committee um, Paul and myself, Brad Anderson from Missouri, Hunter McBrayer from Alabama. Um, and so we just had a really good mix of um, people that may be fairly new to the organization and also have, you know, are more seasoned professionals that have been around in the system for a long time um, and had a lot to share. So um, we, we met virtually most of the time and we covered a lot of different topics um, when when we discuss leadership and innovation and extension. So um, most of our conversations really focused on the leadership role with innovation and how do we um, how do we change the culture that we currently have in the system to become more innovative and what role does leadership play in that. Um, so each time we met, we, we had a new focus um, for the discussion. Uh, we talked about, you know, specifically culture change, but also training for leadership, training for new employees, um, and just kind of ran the gamut that way. Um, Paul, do you have anything else to add on what we covered? Uh, yeah, you know, we had a really good mix of people that were rather new, um, kind of the next younger generation um, in extension, but also um, established leaders who've, who have a lot of experience, who spent a uh, majority of their careers in extension. Um, and so it was really good to get that uh, feedback from everyone from different perspectives. And um, Keith Smith did a really good job with his, um, with his um, uh, research assistants uh, working on this project. And so what we do is they would send out like a week before, here's a topic um, and we'd use box to collaborate um, and, you know, edit a document and just submit our, our uh, insight uh, recommendations, just what our opinion was about, you know, say something like promoting innovation and extension leadership. And then another one was creating a culture of innovation. And then another one was about hiring an extension to promote innovation. And so we all kind of gave our two cents. And, uh, and then from there, they kind of, they went through, took the best stuff, compiled this uh, report that's uh, coming out, it's forthcoming. So, uh, so it was really neat to, uh, to go through there. You know, I, I put something in there, I check back in a day and then see what everyone else had put. And we kind of go back and forth on what our thoughts were. And then we would uh, meet, meet together face to face or virtually and, uh, and then discuss it even further. So leadership's been mentioned a couple of times, Paul, how, from either your view or what you heard from the fellow task force members, how important is administrative leadership in sort of making extension more innovative? Um, not that important at all, actually. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's, you know, it really, we're, we're, a, we're a, you know, a top down organization and generally change, you know, starts from the bottom um, and it can only really work up so far. Um, and so we really need the buy-in from, from leaders to, you know, allocate funds to direct resources to uh, new and innovative uh, ideas and programs. And so we spent a lot of time, if you look through the report, you'll see that there's like, if you, if you did an FH search for risk taking, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of risk taking involved in, in being innovative. And so, I mean, anything that's innovative is probably not going to work out, you know, the first time or it's going to, you're going to need to iterate. And so, 
in, in order to get that that right fit for uh, for the program. So uh, we we discussed that quite a bit uh, as far as you know everything went back to oh we have this you know we need to do an innovation program to train uh, you know new new hires on how to be innovative and uh, and we need buy in from from the top uh, deciding if that's something that is worth their time. And, and we had a really good discussion about that. I mean, there were some great points that not everyone needs to be an innovator. We need innovators, but we also need implementers. And, uh, and, and it's good to get that insight because a lot of times, you know, younger folks think everyone needs to be an innovator when, when um, you know, you just don't always see that perspective uh, from the administrator's point of view. Yeah, one of the more controversial conversations that we had um, as a task force was when we were on the topic of does everyone need to innovate? And I made the comment that some folks want to just be told what to do. Um, and you would have thought, thought that a bomb went off <laughs> in the virtual room that we were meeting in um, because some of, um, you know, some of the members of the task force weren't really sure how to respond to that and, and took a little offense to it, um, thinking that, well, we, we only hire the best in extension. Of course, they're not just sitting around waiting to be told what to do on a daily basis. We hire entrepreneurs. We hi hire individuals that um, work independently and are used to that. Um, but that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the point of the comment. The comment was to say not everyone wants to, you know, always be sitting around thinking of new ways of working. They would rather look to someone else to say, you know, show me the lead and I will follow you. So, um, so that was a really good, actually a good discussion that we had following that comment, following that meeting um, for several weeks online. Um, and Bob, you asked about the experience, and I think this was one of the groups that I've worked with um, that is that uh, is a good mix of folks that have been in the system for a long time and, and the younger people that may be more used to working virtually that worked really well together virtually. I mean, we used, um, we used Box and we used Zoom um, for 90% of the time that we did our work, so, and it worked out really well. So I was really impressed with how the group came together and, and you know, crank this report out and did a really good job with the content all in a virtual, you know, a virtual um, format. So, you know, Paul, you mentioned risk taking and one of the things I struggle with that occurs to me is that cooperative extension really is an institution. I mean, its purpose is defined in legislation, you know, in the Smith-Lever Act of 1914, it says what we're supposed to do. Um, and it's hard to imagine how uh, that shouldn't make us risk adverse. Like how can we be innovative when, you know, if we look at companies that are innovative, you know, sometimes they transform themselves completely, um, you know, become go from making products to delivering services and, and, you know, are always going after that next thing. We have this, if we want to consider it, do you consider it a restriction of uh, the Smith Lever Act says, who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. How do we be risk takers and innovators in that context? Um, I think, I think uh, you know, we are limited. We are kind of painted into this box of like, this is what you do. This is, uh, you know, and this is very established. We've been doing this for X number of years, but um, I think we, we look at the times and we say, how can we, uh, how can we be relevant? Uh, because if, if we still continue to do the things that we've always done, um, you know, and, and many cases we have, and we've fallen out of relevance uh, with our clientele. And so um, we've, we've seen, you know, constantly I go to conferences and the theme is like, you know, being, you know, getting our clients back or, or let's be relevant again, in, you know, in people's lives. And, and I think we need to accept the changes that are occurring that maybe we will serve less people. But I think uh, we will, we need to look at ways that we can uh, find these niche groups of people um, and and uh, try to be you know try to be stop trying to be everything to everyone and and trying to be everything to a smaller uh, uh, market a smaller segment of of clientele um, because you see you see highly influential uh, thought leaders on the internet that are you know they're they're huge they're getting millions and millions of views but when you look at it, a million views or a million uh, comments or you know, several hundred comments on a blog that's followed by a couple million people really isn't a lot. But then these people, uh, they're, they're, 
followed like almost religiously um, by this you know particular thought leader. And so I think that we need to kind of shift our, our thinking and trying to be everything to our county, but looking at different markets where we can um, we can serve them um, more completely. People online right now and people in our communities are looking for people to follow relevant sources of information. And then as as you reach you know more people, I think we just have to um, accept that they're going to spread. Um, you know, the of, of our if we have quality work, they're going to spread uh, through word of mouth. And uh, and I think we have a, a long way to climb. I think the last. 30 years or so um, as far as technology goes not a lot has uh, not a lot changed uh, prior to social networks I mean there were people that yeah they they got their desktop they learned how to work the mouse and everything and uh, and then you know and they got doing email but then then with the social networks and a lot of the web 2.0 um, mobile devices come about and then you got video conferencing and all these things get, keep getting better and better it's uh, it's it's really kind of overwhelmed our workforce, especially at a time in their careers where uh, it's just not as easy to accept change. And so um, I think I think we need to look at um, constantly be looking at new opportunities. We've talked about it here in in uh, in this in this uh, report about uh, really, you know, making it a priority to stay on top of new and upcoming technology. Um, and that's really kind of a role that we can play in e with the extension is, is have some leaders in extension doesn't necessarily need to be young or, or, or older, more experienced uh, veterans of, of the field, but stay on the pulse of technology and, and the learning network. That's our kind of goal is to talk about these things because every time we have a discussion on new tools, I learned something new and it's usually from someone who's, who's more experienced than me. And they're like, Oh, I've been using this. And so it was really useful that because they shared that with me and now I can uh, check it out. So I, I like to try to be a source of, of information as well uh, and try to uh, adapt new things. But uh, I mean, not all things work. I mean, Google glass was a, was a totally choked, but we tried it and we, you know, we learned and we're going to move on to the next thing. And, uh, and not, a, not everything's going to work, but uh but, you know, hey, I'm really liking uh, the Apple Watch. That's been really cool. So anyway. And a good, a good example of this, you know, we, we had discussions on, you know, how do we change the perspe perceptions of what innovation truly looks like with our current leadership? Um, and in Ohio recently, um, we've been pitching this, I, this concept of forming a cohort for all of our early adopters and innovators in the organization um, who really want to test Google Glass or, you know, th this other technology that we're not really sure how it fits or if it fits with extension programming, but we just need to provide them the opportunity to test it out. Um, and we use the word tinker in this proposal to pitch this cohort concept. Um, and our and several of our administrators really did not like that word. They, they didn't want to um, put an investment into a group that would just be tinkering with something that may not have impact. And so in order to, you know, help us move forward as a system, I think we need to push past some of those um, misconceptions. Um, and there was also a lot of conversation among task force members um, with, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, as Paul was talking, I was, something popped into my head about um, conversation that, that we had and I'm, it left my mind, but I can't think of it. But it was, it was something along the lines of the difference between creating and innovate. Okay, I, I remember what it is now. I'm talking myself through it. Okay, so um, it was <laughs> it was the fact that we've got to um, we've got to give people that actual definition of what innovation looks like because we've been so reactionary um, as a system and as an organization and even just on a daily basis in your office, um, you're reacting to all of the requests that you're getting without even thinking, um, you know, is this what I should be doing? Is this the way that I should be working? Um, should I even print off the, this recipe that I just sat here and Googled because someone walked into the front office and asked me for it? Um, and so in order to truly innovate, we have to allow people to not be reactionary and to be more proactive. And that involves giving them the time to be creative, giving them the time to think um, innovatively. And, and that means freeing up their schedules to be able to do that um, because everyone is just in this busy reactionary mode constantly. Um, and that's reflected in the report. There's a lot of information in the report about um, making sure that leadership is on board and extension with holding people accountable to carving out time 
to sit and just think and reflect and, um, and be creative. And that will allow them to not be so reactive and, and to be a little bit more reactive, which hopefully will lead into creativity and innovation. I want to go back to what you mentioned about, you know, the word tinkering. Um, Cause I think that is, uh, I, I think it's, a, it's emblematic of uh, sort of where we are. Um, I guess I would, and I think, I think some of my colleagues across the country would agree, would look at, at Ohio State University Extension as being maybe one of the more innovative systems um, uh, with the changes that you've made with, with your position, um, leading in educational technology there, and, and different things that we've, that we've seen there. Um, and we still have these things like disconnects of, can we use certain words? Can we say hackathon? Can we say tinkering? Um, right. I mean, it see, it just seems like such a daunting cultural challenge if they're, if we can't even ag- agree on language. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It, um, four years ago, we pitched the hackathon event concept, um, to some of our Ohio State University Extension colleagues and it just went right over their heads. Um, we had to completely reframe how we approach this and how we communicated this, this idea of an event, um, in order to make it happen and to get people excited about doing it. Um, so, you know, I guess I have to stick, take a step back and, and reframe this tinkering concept. And the way that I've done that is just, you know, explaining it as a, a pilot project or a pilot process um, and staying away from that, that word of tinkering. But the, the mere fact that I have to do that speaks volumes to, like you said, Bob, where, where we're at with some of our leadership and, um, you know, the folks that really help kick these things off the ground, um, you know, I'm hoping that reports like the um, the Horizon report and our task force report um, for ECOP will maybe help change some of that that thinking um, and get folks on board with with these new words and their definitions um, because it's not something to back away from. It's something that we should be embracing. If we if we want a culture of innovation, which is what I'm hearing constantly over the course of the last year, then we have to be willing to accept some of these new ways of working, even if it means changing you know, how we talk about them and the words that we're using. Yeah, I think it's important to note, Bob, that um, anything prove you know nothing nothing innovative is going to be proven, and so um, that, that that's something that we we kind of default to. Well, is it is it going to work? Is it going to work? And we're like, we don't know. We need to we need to hack this, or uh, we need to tinker. Uh, pilot's a good word, uh, but we we need to find out. And so uh, and, and nowadays it, with with all the different metrics and ways that we can measure um, success and then determine. Uh, and later determine impact if we're making a difference. Um, w- there's so much changing, we have to try a- in order to find out what's going to work. And and if we find out something that does work, we can ride that wave and pretty soon it's not gonna work as as long as it has. We, we've kind of ridden this wave of, of things, o- we, of doing the uh, work the way we always have and it's always worked and we post that you know the announcement of our workshop in uh, at the grocery store or in a common place. Um, in the newspaper and, and, you know, people showed up and, and, and I think we can all agree that that has changed and, and we need to find new ways to engage our audiences, uh, both, uh, in person and, uh, and, uh, virtually. So Paul, what do you think the report itself, uh, when it comes out, what, what role do you see it playing in generating this change? Right. I, I guess my assumption is we don't all think, well, the report will come out and everybody will read it and then we'll all, they'll all go, yes, we'll adopt all these. But is it to kick off a conversation? Is it, What role do you see it playing in the actual change across the country? Um, I think it's going to be a, a something that, that leaders, um, both at the top, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to make many uh, uncomfortable, and, but I think it's going to give hope to uh, the next generation of extension professionals who are kind of coming in uh, that they'll see it and they'll say, oh, this is great. And then they'll have a reference point, something that they can refer to when talking to their uh, their mentors 
um, their, their administrators and say, hey, look, you know, we need to do this. Um, we need to have this position or I need this much more freedom to, to do a project that I, you know, really want to do. Um, I think that it's going to be a great tool that we can uh, reference to say, um, you know, when we get, when, when, you know, it doesn't have to be new employees, but anyone that, that uh, in the, in this, in the system that wants to try something new that's been itching, but feels like they don't have permission. Um, and then, and they were maybe teetering on, should I ask forgiveness later or should I, should I wait and get the permission now? Uh, this will give them the perfect, the perfect opportunity to say, Hey, look on page, on page, uh, you know, 12, it says we should do this. Can I have your support in doing that? And, and, and we say in there, we should provide innovation grants, like mini innovation grants to, to, to beta test, to try something. Uh, we recommend using like the uh, lean, lean, uh, lean startup, lean experimentation, uh, where you don't have to do this grand plan, this, um, this overhaul of an of a existing program. You can beta test with a very small sample size, a very small experiment that say, instead of asking for a $50,000 grant to hire an intern and to buy out your time and, and resources to, to roll out you know, a statewide program, you can test it in a smaller county, say, um, that you can uh, then show some impact and then, and then uh, grow from there. And so I think that's, uh, that's, there's some insight in there that, talks about how we can do that, but also um, it'll be a good reference point for, for uh, anyone that's wanting to be innovative that maybe hasn't had the opportunity or felt like they had the opportunity yet. Uh, but we, we did talk at length on, is this going to be another report that uh, we write? We, we've met, you know, like, like six, seven times and uh, we've spent hours contributing to collectively. So if you look at the collective time and, and everyone's, you know, salary and, you know, and, and did the math on what, the actual cost was and just time that we put into this, you know, we certainly don't want to lay this to rest and uh, ignore it and have it just be another report that's, um, you know, in your uh, massive file of reports. And so uh, we're planning to do, we talked about a uh, series of webinars. Uh, we're already submitted presentation, uh, some proposals to JSEP and, uh, and then looking for, um, you know, kind of putting these presentation materials in a box folder so that anyone who wants to present on these things at their annual conference or at any other national uh, state conference can uh, can take those resources, meet with some of the task force members, and then uh, share it with their state, kind of be the emissary from, from their particular state because we can't, of course, get everywhere. But then also talking about doing a town hall, a uh, nationwide town hall meeting on innovation and extension with this kind of being the, the – um, the foundation of, uh, and the topics we discuss, but, you know, on the questions. So kind of like what we do with the EdTech Learning Network uh, with a Twitter chat, but just a very open town hall with uh, many of the extension directors involved and, and other extension professionals. Well, speaking of the Twitter chats, uh, I want to talk about a couple of tweet ups that have, that have happened in the last couple of months. And the first, first one is, uh, the discussion about County fairs and, and I love Jamie, how you guys frame that discussion of taking on the sacred cow you know I think it relates to this innovation conversation in terms of what are our priorities and what kinds of things are we doing were you surprised uh, was there anything in that conversation that surprised you about how people felt about county fairs and their role in their extension work um, not necessarily. I, we, we know our membership well enough at this point, especially the folks that are, are actively involved in the tweet ups on a regular basis. Um, there wasn't really anything that came out of it that shocked me. Um, but it was interesting to see the conversation unfold. You know, we asked questions about, um, you know, what, what would you change if you could change something differently? Um, and, and really asked some tough questions about, you know, what would happen if fair just went away? Would, would people miss it? Um, and, and some, some folks said, yeah. And, and some folks said, no, I think the majority of everyone thought that at least someone would miss it, but it might, um, just be, you know, the 4-H youth or, um, people that have been coming to the fair and involved in the fair, you know, fair board members would be <laughs> the group that would miss it the most probably. Um, so, you know, I, I like when we can have the tweet ups that really focus on those tough questions um, because 
I actually I went to the 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 FCS conference at any if any AFCS last week um, and I had someone bring this up and she wasn't even actively involved in in that tweet up she was a lurker um, but we have all these lurkers that that mill around and, that we don't know about with the EdTech LN um, and she said that was one of the most enjoyable um, discussions that she had ever seen in front of her you know on a tweet up on Twitter, or otherwise, um, because we were really asking tough questions, and a lot of people were saying things that other folks may have been thinking of in the back of their minds, but maybe were too afraid to come forward and say it, or just you know really didn't necessarily want to talk about it in front of other people. Um, so the fact that we can have really good candid conversations uh, with our membership, I think, is a really good sign, um, and a lot of people in, enjoyed that one and. Uh, and they like the, the sacred cow term because it really is, it, it is the ultimate sacred cow when we talk about fair. Um, but, you know, I, I think it really does, one of the things that came out of that tweet up um, was this, this fact that I had kind of forgotten about, um, and that's that fair definitely means different things to different counties around the United States. So, um, you know, just south of me in Montgomery County in Ohio, um, we have Dayton, which is a, an urban center and fair doesn't mean the same um, to folks there as it does in um, Dark County, which is just west of me and completely rural. So you've got different levels of involvement um, from county to county and state to state. Um, and it you know, some folks in, in one county affair disappeared, it's, you know, it's a big part of their lives and it would definitely be missed. Um, so there was some conversation that happened around, well, what if we went regional? And, and you know, and then, oh man, you know, the red flags went off left and right. And, and that started a whole other conversation um, about, well, we've tried this with other things. It doesn't really work. So, um, so there are lots of great side conversations that stemmed from just that main conversation of, what would happen if this went away? Um, I think we could have the same conversation on what would happen if extension went away. You know, would anyone miss it? Who would miss it? Um, what would it look like? So it was, it was really good. I, I love that topic. And uh, I can't remember who, who came up with it. It was probably Paul. So I'll just say it was Paul's idea. <laughs> Well, Paul, I mean, one of the things that I was interesting in there that um, I guess it's it's maybe a no-brainer, but I, I hadn't thought about it in terms of top of mind, is just the role of the county fair in sort of this idea of community building and bringing the community together, uh, which, which to me, I guess, you know, um, more directly ties it to extension work than, you know, organizing, you know, how the animals are going to be shown and handing out the ribbons and stuff like that, which obviously relates to 4-H, but it, you know, there's some organizational, some kind of work sometimes that doesn't seem to directly relate to mission. So what do you think about that idea of, of County Fair as community building and, and were you struck by that? Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people um, on that Twitter chat still believe that um, I'm on the County Fair board um, in Washington County, Utah. And, uh, and if you ask every board member, I mean, this is all about building the community. This is why our commissioners fund it. This is, um, it's like the last family friendly, um, event in, in, uh, around. And so, um, but we also had the discussion about how it's become very commercialized. It's not about, it's not about education. I mean, case in point, I set up, um, I, I, I attend, uh, many maker fairs and at maker fair, Google, there at most of them and they set up a big uh, tent and there's a learn to solder tent and people come in and they learn how to solder and they get to keep this little blinking badge and I thought hey that would be great I'm going to do that and I made a, a 4-H uh, uh, badge that they could solder and, and, and everything and um, the first day we had it stationed like in this in this building right in front of where all the rides are and uh, and do you think anyone was really interested in, in learning a new skill? No, they were there for the entertainment. They were there to go on the rides and, and to have a good time. And so uh, it's kind of almost an afterthought. It's like, oh, let's have fun. And then we'll walk around and eat something, you know, extremely unhealthy. And then 
if we have time, we'll go check out some exhibits, maybe a quilt, uh, maybe there's some animals and, and things like that. So it's, it's become, and, and that was kind of the discussion. A lot of people are like, yeah, it has become really commercialized. It does mean a lot to a few people who are exhibiting, who are showing. And, uh, but, but I mean, you look at the, for our fair, we get like 40,000 people out to our fair and total exhibitors, maybe 3,000. And so, yeah, the people that exhibit, that they would totally, they are bought in. Um, they, are, uh, they believe in the community aspect of, of what the fair uh, brings to them because it's an opportunity to demonstrate their mastery, to get judged, to get feedback, and then try again next year. It's this growth mindset. Um, these, they're, they're lifelong learners. But then there's the majority, um, the, the, the majority that just the fair the, the fact that they, they, a lot of them don't even know that we have, um, that we have exhibits anymore. It's just food rides. And so, it, it, you know, it, we talked about, should we, you know, do we need to separate those two things? Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it was good discussion. And, uh, and I think that, you know, the fair, it still has relevance uh, for a lot of people. And uh, as long as you can justify it, I think it's, it's something that we should continue to do. Um, even though I, uh, I can't tell whether at the fair, if I have a tan at the end or if it's just dirt, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it's dirt, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other one I want to quickly touch on is, uh, um, is the, uh, tweet up that was done on controversial subjects in, in extension. And, and you guys had Kevin Fulta on from university of Florida, who's dealt with, uh, you know, some backlash, um, and with having to try and talk in a, in a research-based scientific way about, about GMOs, which is a hot topic. So, um, so tell me about that conversation, Paul, and, and how you think that went. Did it, um, did it go sort of the way that you would have expected it to go? Um, it was, uh, as far as the discussion goes, I moderated. Were you there, Jamie? I think you were, right? Yeah, you were there. Um, so I moderated Kevin Fulta. I uh, just started uh, – he came up with the questions. Um, we, you know, as the Learning Network, our, our, uh, our advisory um, board, we contribute uh, different questions. And so, but it was really good to kind of get, he asked questions, but he also provided insight as well into his experiences. Um, and, uh, and so w there was a lot of people that I, I, they came out of the woodwork. I had no idea who they were. It was probably one of our most uh, well attended uh, Twitter chats. And uh, there was, there's just a lot of good feedback on how to deal with, uh, deal with, um, you know, people sharing just their opinion versus research based and all that. We even had a troll, our first ever troll show up that trolled uh, Kevin Folta and was like, Hey, uh, you know, putting out links and stuff like that. And so, Hey, I felt, you know, like pretty cool. It's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, when you get your first stalker, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> and then you deal with the fallout from having a troll where there's all these bots like picking up your hashtag and for a day or two afterwards you pull up the hashtag feed and there's just bot after bot after bot but yeah, yeah we were trending <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things Jamie that I, that, um, I was interested in was this was the part of the conversation that um, do you feel like you you know administration would back you if you uh you know were providing science-based research-based information and and the summary seemed to be that es uh administration would back you um and, and uh i guess i hate to be not research-based but my <laughs> I, I was surprised by that uh, i feel like there is a there's a feeling throughout extension that this is this is water we should not tread yeah, and, and I think um, maybe most of the reason for that is that folks just don't know how to handle it. You know, that um, I, I've talked to several um, people in ANR and horticulture here in Ohio that um, they're afraid to tackle the issues of, of GMOs and, and other of the, you know, things that shouldn't be considered controversial but are, um, mainly because of social media and things that are spreading the misinformation that's out there. Um, but they're, they're just afraid to take it on because they're, they're not sure what could happen if they, if they try. You know, we really don't have great examples of people in extension that are taking this stuff head on 
um, and, and have been for at least a little while so that they can say, hey, this is, this is how I did it and, and hand it over to other people that are, are afraid, like they want to step out there and take on some of this inf misinformation, but they're just not sure how to go about it. Um, you know, like a lot of people are, are wanting to follow someone else's lead with this. So if we can get more, more examples, I think that would be good. And that was one reason why we asked Kevin to host a tweet up because he's been through this. Um, and even though he's not completely extension, um, he's worked with extension and he had enough experience that he could put himself in, in our shoes and, and know where we might be coming from with, with being, you know, a little leery on taking on some of these topics. And he just spoke at um, Netsy over the summer when it was down in, in Florida and shared his experience with um, the, the food babe and uh, having all of his emails uh, requested from her um, constantly over and over again, um, and then dealing with the fallout from her cherry picking information out of those, those email dumps that he had sent. So um, he's been through it and he had the backing and he had the support of his university. And because of his experience, um, University of Florida has been able to, um, to provide information and resources for people to say this is how um, this is how you can handle these kinds of topics and if anything negative happens this is the protocol like this is what we can do because of it and so they're one of the very few universities um, you know land grant universities that that has that to, to hand over to their staff and extension staff in particular um, so if we can learn from his experience and from how the University of Florida handled it and what they may or may not do differently the next time um, I think that that's going to help other people feel comfortable with branching out and tackling some of this and Kevin made a, a really great point a few times during that tweet up that one of the reasons why this misinformation is out there is because extension and the faculty that have this information has been sitting on it. We haven't been out there in the spaces that, um, you know, the pseudoscience experts are in. We're not on Facebook constantly sharing this information. We're not doing it in a way that people want it, using the media that they want to consume the information. And so that's why it's so prolific right now. And that's why it's, it's going to take a while to stomp out. So how we um, tackle this and go about it is really important. Um, and he, he made a lot of great suggestions and, and points on that during the tweet up. And, and, and Bob, one of the, and to anyone listening, one thing that, I mean, one, one thing I've noticed and, and, and what I've done about this is um, really dispelling myths is a, is a strategy uh, that, that we can take in extension. And, uh, and, and many times we don't engage in, in social media because we're too busy doing the research. We're too busy doing the science to, uh, you, you know, to, to get it out there. And, and, and uh, that rests largely on our communicators. Um, and they're, you know, and they're balancing all the different, uh, you know, areas of expertise and, and all the specialists and county um, faculty and educators. And so, uh, one thing that I, I often do uh, trainings, uh, workshops with uh, farmers and ranchers who are um, who are asking, what do I do on social media? Um, you know, and and how do I deal with the, some of the haters? And uh, and one thing that um, that we found, at least in, in the work that I've been doing with farmers and ranchers, is uh, is really not only just telling their story, but looking like searching for for you know certain. What's their area of expertise? And then to take the information that they learn from the university and then to start to dispel those myths and then have them engage. Because a lot of times we put everything on our shoulders in extension, but we forget that we have like this amazing base of volunteers who are willing to go to bat for us and to back us up and to reference our research and then kind of go to battle for us um, some uh, in, in some instances. And so, um, and that that's one thing, I mean, we're, we're, you know, in the past, Extension dealt with these snake oil salesmen that would roll into town and, and uh, we were the experts and people would come to us, is this legit, you know? And, uh, and now we're dealing with that on steroids, but in, in a lot of senses, we've kind of cowered from that. We were like, oh, I don't want to go there because that doesn't feel comfortable. And uh, maybe we don't, we don't always have to. Um, and there's diplomatic ways we discussed in the, in the Twitter chat. Um, we discussed a lot of ways we can be diplomatic about things and, and, and we, the importance of listening because so much we're, we're in there trying to, uh, you know, 
push our agenda. But it, and, and if we want to really push our agenda, the best thing to do is to listen and care first. And so uh, that was uh, some really good insight. But I think it's also important that we can utilize volunteers and get their help in uh, dispelling myths, um, debunking the uh, the snake oil salesman on steroids. And so uh, we just we need to utilize all of our resources and not just think that everything's on our shoulders. Well, speaking of uh, taking advantage of, of the crowd there a little bit, um, Paul, tell, tell me about this anthology that, that EdTech Learning Network is working on uh, with, with some co-authors throughout the system. Oh, uh, you heard about that, huh? Uh, <laughs> I got, some, I got some, an email from someone. Yeah, what we're doing is uh, inspired by the work of TJ Talbert, if you've ever heard of the Extension Workers Code. Uh, we thought that it's time to do something like that um, for the next generation of extension professionals. Um, really, it's kind of been inspired by, you know, we go to these conferences, um, you work with colleagues across your state, and you look at the numbers and many, many extension professionals are going to be retiring in the next five to 10 years. We're going to lose a lot of our workforce. I've talked to Jamie at length about this, um, you know, looking at Ohio, in Ohio, particularly the turnover and in Utah, same thing. And so uh, I, I'm almost at the point now where like, I'm kind of an, I'm not like an old timer, but like I'm not new anymore. And so uh, it feels weird because I was always the new guy, but I just see as people leave one by one. Um, and then as they start to leave and like, you know, smaller cohorts, uh, I just see so much organizational knowledge and wisdom leaving. And this is, again, a generation that's just not into, not used to, they don't have the, the you know, the um, habit of blogging, of tweeting, of, of working out loud. And so they're taking so much wisdom uh, with them as they, as they head into retirement. And, and it makes me sad because I, there's many that I, I call and I'm like, Hey, what would you do in this situation? I've got this, you know, this uh, volunteer that doesn't like me for this reason. How would you, how would you smooth this over? Uh, how would you solve, how would you get people to this event? Um, or how did you in the past? And, and uh, what are some you know ways that we can, uh, you know, innovate. And there's so much great advice and, and wisdom that, uh, that I think we need to extract from them before they leave. And uh, because I, I, I need it, it's, this, is a, this is something I need, but uh, I know that my, my colleagues need it as well. And so we want to do something similar uh, to where, similar to like, so TJ Talbert, he wrote 46 sections um, with just wonderful advice that's still applicable today. And so what we want to do instead of just one person is take the collective advice from, you know, 30, 40 uh, extension professionals who are um, at the height of their career, kind of ready to, to retire uh, pretty soon but in that range and have them, you know, share in 300 to 500 words and write a little section about, about um, some wisdom. Maybe it's, it's about dealing with conflict. Maybe it's about presenting. Maybe it's about uh, engaging clients. Uh, maybe, maybe it's about, you know, uh, just working in social media and, and uh, managing that your social life with your, uh, you know, online social life with your personal life and, and how to deal with that. And so there's so many different topics that, um, that have changed over, you know, the course of almost 100 years that I think it's time that we put together a book, kind of an anthology of wisdom from uh, extension professionals, you know, from extension professionals for extension professionals. And that's kind of the, uh, the project. So um, extension worker book. Uh, dot eventbrite.com you can sign up if you want to participate and share your wisdom we have certain topics you can address but you can also um, I know Bob you're you're signed up and so you could uh, you, I think you signed up for some topics and then you also wanted to talk about you know something else um, and so uh, certainly feel free to um, to apply for that or we've got um, I think I've got about 10 spaces left. I'd, I'd open it up to you more if, if more people um, were interested. But uh, definitely, if, if anyone who's listening um, has been in extension uh, for a, a majority of their career, we'd love to hear from you. And, uh, and don't go without, uh, without sharing uh, at least one thing that can help another uh, extension professional. So think about the thing that you wish you would have known uh, you know, at the beginning of your career, uh, because that's what we need to know. And I think one of the great things about this project is that we struggle with good um, 
mentorship programs in extension. And I'm just saying, generally speaking, you know, there may be states that have awesome mentor mentee programs out there. Um, but from my experience and in talking with others, it's definitely something that's lacking, especially now that we have so much turnover in the system um, with our boomers retiring and younger folks coming in and maybe not staying very long. And then we have even more people coming in. Um, and so this, this could be an opportunity to have like that mentor just sitting on your desk and, and ready and, and waiting to pick it up and, and get some advice um, for the people that feel like they may be all alone and don't have anyone to, you know, to call if they have those questions or to text or, you know, I am. So um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's Paul's brainchild. I'm just lucky to be along for the ride. And uh, I think that it's going to be a great um, opportunity to showcase the power of a network. And I know, Bob, you're big into, into networks and, and what they can do and what they can accomplish together. Um, and I think it's going to be awesome to harness all the potential that we have and the wisdom that we have in this uh, learning network and even outside of the, the network now as people are starting to hear about it and get on board. Um, we could definitely use some more administrators and directors um, to get on board with this project and uh, give us their wisdom and their expertise and, um, and their feedback and comments too. So. And we can find more out about that project and the tweet ups and everything on the website. Yep. Um, we also have had uh, some, some email blasts go out to the learning network. Um, but if you go to extedtechs.org, um, you can get some information there. I don't think we have anything specifically on the anthology up on the website yet, um, but we can certainly get that, that info up um, and uh, we'll put the link um, in the, the podcast description. Let's do that, Bob. All right, let's do that. We'll put that in the show notes. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Paul and Jamie, for, for all your work at, uh, in, the, in the system and, and also for joining us today on the podcast. Thanks, Thank Bob. Both. Always fun. Uh, Paul Hill, Utah State University, Jamie Sager from The Ohio State University. They're the co-leaders of the eExtension Educational Technology Learning Network. You've been listening to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. You can find us on Twitter at WDNEXT. All the podcasts are on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash working differently. Show notes at bobbirch.com. Our theme music is Newton's Acid by And Nobody Cared. It's used under Creative Commons license, and you can find it at gemendo.com. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.